It's a, it's a real privilege to be here, and especially given the subject that I've been asked to talk about, which is sport. And sport runs through the very blood that is in my veins. I was, some of you may be able to tell, I was born in a city in the UK called Liverpool. And in Liverpool, yeah, 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 a bit more, come on. In Liverpool, the city is divided in two, red and blue. And anywhere I go in the world, people ask me, are you a red or are you a blue? And I'm a red, very proud red. And so whether I'd wanted to be into sport or not wasn't really my choice. I was born in Liverpool. So sport formed the background of my growing up. And really it's become my passion and it's led to every kind of decision I've ever made. And here at Zinzino, we are obsessed with sport because sport represents the best of us. And so what I'm going to talk to you about in a slightly different way, perhaps, is about the power of sport and why sponsorship of sport matters to us. Now, going back a little bit to that, that child in Liverpool who was a red or a blue and growing up and having to make those kind of decisions and our families were cut down the middle. You know, it was all about which side of the city you were on and what it was that you had a faith and a belief in. And this started to tell the story of your life. And then you kind of get used to that. And it wasn't until later on, in fact, until 2005, that I realized just how important it was. And the reason being is that in 2005, I personally had the treble. So I, I married my wife, which was incredible. My first child was born. But then one that matches them and is on every bit the same level is that one night in Istanbul, Liverpool won the Champions League and took home the European Cup. Two years prior to that, in Sydney, Australia, England rugby team, in the closing minutes of the World Cup final, Johnny Wilkinson, I get goosebumps now even saying this, kicked the ball over the sticks and we took the World Cup out of the Australians' hands. And you start to realise that your life is punctuated by these moments and that sport is emotive. And this morning, you know, we listened to Kendra Hall talk about stories and the emotive power they have. And yesterday, what really captured me was when Orion was on this stage and he talked about the adversity he'd overcome and how sport had played a part in that when he became the captain of a team, when he took to tie boxing. When Dog came out, one of the things that defined him was his love of Tottenham Hotspur, which is unfortunate, but it's still good that he has some sport and interest and he's picked a team. So it becomes a part and it is emotive. And the reason being, when we go back to that storytelling nature, is that there is an arc of narrative in sport. And it's the same as the Ulysses, written a long time ago. It's the same as Harry Potter, written more recently. Is that we have our hero. And we have the moment of change. The moment that takes them out of their comfort zone. We see the challenges that they must face and embrace. What they have to overcome to be successful. And then we see the resolution. And in sport... We get that every 90 minutes, or we get that every less than 10 seconds, or we get it in less than two hours or 80 minutes, or whatever your sport is, you get to watch that theater of drama play out, and it resonates with us. Just two weeks ago, Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder, huge, big third boxing match. When Tyson Fury went to the canvas twice, and the world watched him get back onto his feet. What they watched was not a man who was overcoming his, his opponent. What the world watched was a man who was overcoming himself. Everybody knows the mental health issues that that fighter, that athlete has dealt with. And what it takes to overcome that and to emerge new. And so great drama is writ large throughout sport. And that's what we see. And across the board, we see this arc of narrative. And so all of us want to play a part in that. We want to wear red or blue, preferably red. <laughs> We're all writing our own story. And I love this quote from Daniel Kahneman, who's a, an impressive guy. I would encourage you all to read his work, which is the notion that we don't choose to do based on what it will be, but we choose the things that we're going to do based on the memory that it will become. And sport creates great memories. Sport creates great moments in life when we bind ourselves to it. It has a huge part to play and it helps us to overcome things in our own life. It certainly helped Orion. 
So when we look at that, we realize that sport has a huge impact. But I'm going to quantify that for you because actually sport has a huge global impact. And right here now, this is the real measurable impact that sport has. And we look across the top line there, there are 3 billion active followers of soccer. We go through this top 10 all the way through and down to golf. We've got rugby in there, baseball, table tennis. We're not talking about small numbers. We are talking about billions and millions of people who are engaged in sport on a daily basis. Then we start to look at it with regards to viewing figures. These are some of the biggest moments in our lives. When we have the Olympics and we have World Cups, you know, I've been really fortunate to work in sport for over 27 years now. And I've never lost the excitement. When you walk out onto a rugby pitch, when you're a part of an international team and you're representing and you're going to take on the opposition, you know, having worked with athletes who've gone to the Olympics, watch them go from children into mature athletes who then bring home a medal to their country and what that means to them, to the nation, to society, to their families. It's huge. And we watch this. We engage because we love the passion and the power of play. 3.5 billion people watch the FIFA World Cup. It's huge. The chances are when you speak to someone, it's greater than 50-50 that they will have an interest in sport. The value of sport is also immense and it's growing year on year. We are a, a society that is saturated in sports consumption through the clothing that we wear, the branding that we wear. And it's estimated to keep growing for some time, estimated to reach 599.9 billion in 2025. A huge amount of money goes through the hands of sports. And because of that, because of that power, that economic power, that social and emotional power, the story that sport tells, well, it has influence, and the world has changed. And something happened quite recently that showed the real power of sport, and it was this, the billion-dollar swap. And for me, this was a very welcome game-changer, because when that happened, when Ronaldo moved a type of product from one point to another to dismiss it, not wanting to be associated. The value of a huge company dropped by a billion overnight. That tells you everything you need to know about where now sponsorship and association rest in sport. It's time to do things better and it's time to do things differently. And just earlier today, I was having a conversation with Doug about this very thing, about sponsorship, about the, the kinds of athletes and the teams that we are talking to, that we are working with, who are starting to implement and use our products, and why this matters to us, and the types of relationships that we want. And what we want are authentic relationships. We want to be involved with athletes and with teams on a global scale where they recognize the value of what we do where it's a part of their culture, where it's not just about paying money to be a headline feature. It's far more than that, far more substantial than that. What we want is to be a part of their story. We want to be a legitimate part of that process. And so, believe it or not, despite the fact that we're not playing the big headline game of just throwing money so that you can weave that into marketing, we cherry pick. We like athletes who have the same aspirations. Here are some of our athletes now. Each of them phenomenal, in my opinion. Each of them highly aspirational. Each of them who are working towards the achievement of their dreams and their goals, who are writing their own story. More importantly, each and every single one of these athletes uses our product because they know the value of it. They're not swapping it across when they're doing a press interview. And that's really, really important to be a part of the story. And so, as somebody with a background, as a nutritionist with a background in sport, a lot of the conversations that I get brought into on behalf of Zinzino are, well, why would our athletes be interested? Why would we want to use your product? So, I'm going to talk to you a little moment now about something we call marginal gains. And you've probably heard of marginal gains. It's been popularized. And the idea of marginal gains is simply this. 
rather than looking at making a 100% improvement in one area, we look at making a 1% improvement in 100 areas, and we look for that competitive edge. We look for how we can do things differently and better to gain the advantage on our opposition. That's what we look to do, marginal gains. So when I'm working with a team or an athlete, it's upon me as a knowledge broker to link them to the research evidence and have a look at what could make that difference, what could give our athlete that marginal gain, that edge, the difference between second place and first place, which is huge, the difference between a medal and going home without a medal. And so what I'm going to draw your attention to at the moment is, is one of our key interests, which is omega-3. And there is a universal recognition of the importance of omega-3, the omega-6-3 ratio, the omega-3 index in the context of health. Well, believe it or not, for those of you who might not know, there's also an agreement that it's important in sport performance. A lot of people get distracted with conversations about carbohydrates and protein, and, and for sure they play a part. But actually, just like the rest of us mortal humans, if we're not right at a cellular level, if we're not right at a systemic level, then a lot of that goes to waste, and it's certainly not optimized. But if we have a look at this, and this is a brief trawl through the research, what we see is that, you know, this relative ratio that we require of getting an individual above a percent of total with regards to omega-3. I'd imagine all of you are familiar with this now. When we look at our athletes and a study that was done quite recently and looked at collegiate athletes, which is a really good level, their average was 4.4, which is way off. There's this estimation that because you're fit and active and in sport that you might be getting this right. And it's not that the intention isn't there. It's just that the product isn't there. And that's where we intervene, because as we know, our product is not only effective, it's the most effective, it's the most quantifiably effective at achieving this. And we want to achieve it. Sports nutritionists, sports scientists, sports coaches, the world over want to achieve it, because look at these with regards to our marginal gains. We get increased expression of anabolic signaling molecules. In other words, we get a bigger anabolic response. We train, we compete, we get stronger, we get bigger where we need to. Increased rate of muscle protein synthesis in response. So that protein that's important, well, guess what? When we've got our omega-6-3 and our omega-3 index right, that works better for us as well. Faster oxygen kinetics. We have greater endurance potential and capacity and the reduced content of markers of inflammation, which is a key part, because if we keep adding the stress, we keep breaking down the system. Sticking to this notion, I'm going to take you through a thought process for a moment. This notion of marginal gains. Here's how we would look at it. We'd look at the review of the literature. We'd see what the potential was and see what the application of that is within the sport we're working in. So we see here that a recent review has suggested that we will see enhanced recovery from physiological stress, which is what sport is and training for sport certainly is. And then we'll see cognition, such as reaction time and memory improve. So now what I'd like you to do is draw your attention to the last Olympics. And here we have the women's 100 meter final. Gold crossing that line to get gold at that event which was a world record, by the way, was 10.61 seconds. Fourth place, which means you don't even get a picture, never mind the medal, no one remembers you. Sport can be tough. The difference was 0.3 seconds. That was the difference. Fourth place, no medal, no legendary tale. But when we look at the reaction time, if you remember, I just told you reaction time is really important. We can change that by enhancing and optimizing the omega-3 status. Well, the reaction time, the difference actually between gold and fourth place was 0.008 seconds. If I can improve that by a little bit, you go home with a bronze and people know your name. If I can improve it a little bit more, you get silver. And who knows, given enough time, I might get you to gold. That's a marginal gain. That could be the difference between getting it right and being fourth. Our summary of marginal gains. We get increased muscular development, increased reaction time, increased aerobic capacity, decreased muscle breakdown, decreased muscle soreness, and most importantly, we get to inspire change. 
We get to play a part in this story. We get to change history by changing what order in which people cross the line. The difference between the winners and losers, the difference between whether red or blue get the success, and the difference that matters in all those stories that are in the telling. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to speaking to you.